coming up on this episode of Crime Family. This was such a huge case. The public was so invested, kind of scrutinizing and watching it minute by minute. And so we'll see kind of what happened and go into some of the jurors' perspectives in the aftermath of this case. So I don't know. It's just when you have someone who's that much of a liar, you can't. It just muddies the water so much. I don't know. I don't know what to believe. When I first went into this, I had in my mind that, yeah, she's 100% premeditated murder. But then once I get into the details of all this evidence, now I'm not completely convinced. That could have been the whole difference. That could have made our case for us. Mm -hmm. So it's just like crazy that that little piece didn't get, get in there. Can you imagine? That could have shifted this whole thing. Crazy. It was a crazy case. I know. There's like so much back and forth. Yeah, that like you still don't even know what the hell happened. I mean, you never will. Like, it's one of those things you're never going to know. Hey everyone, welcome to Crime Family. I'm Katie and I'm here with Stephanie and AJ, my brother and sister, and we are on episode number four in our murder of Kaylee Anthony case. And in our previous episodes, we've talked about all the evidence, the trial, the background, and the discovery of Kaylee's body, all the lies that her mother, Casey Anthony, told. And it's her mother, Casey Anthony, that was on trial for her murder. And so this episode, we're going to kind of go into some of the big pieces or really just one big piece of evidence that the prosecution kind of missed that could have been a game changer. We're going to talk about the verdict and what happened and also kind of the backlash that took place after the verdict was read because this was such a huge case. The public was so invested and kind of scrutinizing and watching it minute by minute and so we'll see kind of what happened and go into some of the jurors perspectives in the aftermath of this case so after kaylee anthony's murder trial july 5th 2011 this is when the jury finally went into the deliberation they only deliberated for 11 hours which i think is not that much when you sometimes you think of other cases where it takes days for them to come to a decision but in this one it was only 11 hours and they reached a verdict of not guilty for first degree murder and for the charge of aggravated child abuse she was also found not guilty and for the charge of aggravated manslaughter of a child she was also found not guilty and she was found guilty on four counts of lying to the police but that's all and that's just a misdemeanor charge. State of Florida versus Casey Marie Anthony. As to case number 2008, CF 15606-O. As to the charge of first degree murder, verdict as to count one, we the jury find the defendant not guilty, so say we all, dated at Orlando, Orange County, Florida, on this fifth day of July, 2011, signed four person. As to the charge of aggravated child abuse, verdict as to count two, we the jury find the defendant not guilty. So say we all, did it at Orlando, Orange County, Florida, this fifth day of July, 2011, signed four person. As to the charge of aggravated manslaughter of a child, verdict as to count three, we the jury find the defendant not guilty. So say we all, did it at Orlando, Orange County, Florida, this 5th day of July, 2011, signed for person. As to the charge of providing false information to a law enforcement officer, verdict as to count four. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of providing false information to a law enforcement officer as charged in the indictment. 
And so she was actually sentenced to four years in jail for these charges, but she was released on July 17th, 2011, so just 12 days later. And she was released for time served and good behavior. So after all that, I mean, she did spend a few years in jail, but she got to walk free after this big murder trial. And of course, there was huge backlash from the public because everyone was so invested in this and the public had kind of already convicted her. They saw her as guilty right from the get-go. So in this docu-series that I had been talking about throughout called The Case of Kaylee Anthony, it touches on some of the evidence that was not brought forward or was actually missed during the trial. And one huge piece that they go into is that someone in the Anthony household had actually searched for, quote, foolproof suffocation, end quote, on the day that Kaylee had disappeared. And Jeff Ashton, who was on the prosecution co-counsel, he says that he was not aware of this fact during the trial. And so I guess they had all this data, but they didn't actually use it properly. And the defense attorney, Jose, said that he was expecting the prosecution to bring this up, but they never did. So the defense knew about this search, this foolproof suffocation search, but the prosecution actually never did. Don't you have to bring forward information? Isn't it like a Brady violation to like withhold stuff? Yeah, so they both had access to the same information, but it's just that the prosecution didn't actually dig deep enough to find it. So what actually happened is the prosecution had asked law enforcement to give them a list of the computer searches that were done. So I guess they had, they both had access to the data on this hard drive that they collected from the Anthony computer. And then the prosecution gave it to law enforcement to kind of dig into and bring out all these searches. And so they were asked to give them a list of the computer searches during the time Kaylee went missing, like the day before and after and all that. And they did do that, but I guess apparently the technician that ran these searches was not fully trained or was not trained to look at more than one browser. And so the results that were given did not actually include this search history because it wasn't on the browser that she had looked or that this technician had searched for. So she only did one browser. And I guess this search had come up on the Firefox browser, which was not looked at. This technician didn't look at. Sorry, why would you not look at that? Like, it's so annoying. I don't know. Like, it just says that this technician wasn't trained to look at more than one browser. Either she didn't know to look for more than one browser, or she only knew how to conduct a search on a specific browser, which, you know, it doesn't seem thorough enough. Like, you think that would be standard practice to look at all the browsers? So... You think they'd be trained in that. Or you'd think they'd get someone who was trained to look at every browser. Mm -hmm. Like, why did they just stop at that? Yeah, see, the prosecution, like, didn't know that, though. So when they were handed back the information that they found, they thought that this was everything that could be found. And so they were kind of just oblivious to the fact that it was just one browser. And so when they looked at it, they were like, okay, there's nothing here. So annoying. When, in fact, the defense had someone that was competent and did a full search... And they they found that and they were just like kind of waiting for the, the prosecution to bring it up, this foolproof suffocation, but they never did. So I guess in that case, like, it's not like they had to be like, oh, look what we found. It's because the prosecution should have found that anyway. So the defense didn't have to bring it forward. So why would the defense bring it up if the prosecution didn't, right? Yeah, exactly. And so they didn't have to hand over that evidence because technically the prosecution had that evidence. They just, you know, fumbled, fucked it up and didn't didn't actually find it. So annoying. That could have been the whole difference. Can you imagine? That could have shifted this whole thing. Mm -hmm. If the jury had heard that someone looked up a foolproof suffocation, like that's a huge, huge thing. See, I didn't know that. Yeah. And I guess the prosecution didn't know. Obviously, they didn't know about it either. And he heard about it afterwards. He's like, well, that could have, you know, that could have made our case for us. Mm -hmm. So it's just like crazy that that little piece didn't get, get in there. And so that reporter that AJ had mentioned in a previous episode, Tony Pivotone, they talked to him, so the people in this documentary talked to him 10 years later, and he talks about those search histories that the prosecution missed. What he says about that internet record or that search was, quote, inadvertently not discovered. 
which doesn't really make sense in itself when you think about it, because like you said, you can't inadvertently not discover something. And so the sheriff's office says that the keyword suffocation was never specifically requested. And so they didn't find it or search for it while they were looking in the computer. So I guess one of the things was they looked at this whole browser history. It wasn't there. But also the prosecution had given them certain terms to search. And suffocation was not one of them. So it didn't pop up in their search. So just like a huge opportunity missed. So like I kind of mentioned in the previous episode, so the two main people in this documentary were Jim Clemente, who's a retired FBI profiler, and Laura Richards. She's a former New Scotland Yard behavioral analyst. So they're the ones kind of digging in this documentary, and they do a little bit more digging, and they can't be certain who actually made the search on that computer, like we were talking about before. So it could have been Casey, but someone also brings up that it could have been George, You know, he tried to commit suicide during all of this. So they were thinking it could have been him just kind of looking up a way to kill himself by suffocation. But that's not even in line with how he eventually did try to do it. Like later when you said last episode when he took the pills and the alcohol. Yeah, I know. It didn't doesn't match. But I mean, I guess he could have looked at multiple ways and just went through with one. So, yeah, like I said, they they can't be sure who made that search. And when they look at the timestamps and stuff, like, they just can't be sure. Like, they said they don't know which time zone that these timestamps are in. So they can't line it up with who was home and when. So it's just kind of like a very ambiguous kind of thing. Either way, like, if the prosecution was able to present this one additional piece of evidence, like, it could have changed the whole outcome of this case. But we do know what the outcome was, and Casey Anthony was acquitted of everything except lying to the police. And I think we can all agree that we disagree with the jury's decision here. But like I said before, it's like easy for us, especially now, all these years later, knowing more evidence, looking back, and we could have come to a different conclusion. We weren't sequestered, and we know more than the jury did at the time, and We haven't been instructed to discard certain things and only look at the law to make a decision. Like, definitely, I think our emotions are in it as well. Like, super, it's super emotional. And when you're on the jury, of course, they're like, you can't be emotional about it, which is almost impossible for a lot of people. If you were thinking, if you were on the jury and if you, what would you have voted for? Like, would you have voted for the death penalty? Would you think manslaughter is more appropriate? What do you think, knowing what you know, what your decision would have been? Anybody have opinions on that? It's so hard to say what I would have done because, like you said, I know so much more than they probably would have even known. And I don't know. Obviously, the jurors that were picked were people who didn't know anything about the case. But I had been following it so much that at the time that I knew so much. So I was very biased. Probably if I was on the jury, like I wouldn't have been on it because I would have been biased. But obviously, I think she's 100% guilty. So I would have, you know, said that she was guilty. But I don't I also don't believe in capital punishment so i wouldn't have i wouldn't have been okay with the death penalty but i do you think it's first degree murder though do you think it was premeditated planned out and then executed that's what i'm having a hard time with and that's what the jury had a hard time with too yeah i don't that's a hard thing to prove yeah i don't know i can't say maybe manslaughter but yeah i don't know like i don't get like i'm with aj i don't believe in the death penalty like i don't know if it, like if it was premeditated i I also don't think it was an accident either. So, like, I have no idea what I think, to be honest. Yeah, I think, like, she's guilty and she definitely knew more and she was involved. Yeah, I know she's guilty, but I'm just saying, like, I don't know what. Yeah, I don't buy the accidental drowning theory. So, like, I'm disregarding that in my my mind. So, I think, like, she, whether she, like, gave her something and it was too much and accidentally she died. But I still think, like, she died as a result of Casey doing something that was obviously horrible, whether it was premeditated or not. Okay, let's just say if it was accidental. You made it 20,000 times worse by not reporting it. And what I can't get over is the duct tape around her face. Like, there's no reason for that at all. If it was accidental and she died, why tape up her face? If she wasn't dead and just, like, out cold, why tape up her face? That's what I can't get over, and that's what makes me think they did something purposely to her like that's what i'm thinking like 
duct tape around someone's face, or anything around someone's face to prevent them from like either like biting them or like screaming. So if they were trying to like keep her quiet, then but there's no like evidence of trauma to her body. So like I don't know. But I mean, we don't know that because it, the, there was so much decomposition. Like it was just a skull that they found, pretty much the bone. So we don't know if there was trauma to the body. Like that's something you'd know if you found an actual body. Obviously, yeah, like the duct tape doesn't align with the, the drowning theory at all. So I don't, the, the duct tape makes me think that it was something premeditated. But I don't know. There's so many unknowns. I have my mind made up that I feel like she's 100% guilty of something, but I just don't know what that something is. Premeditated murder or something else. I mean, but the duct tape though, I guess it has to be premeditated. Well, and the, the wrapping of the body, like, let's just discard the accidental thing. Because even if she died accidentally, why wrap her up in something? Yeah, unless you were trying to make it seem, like, unless you were trying to throw people off by putting the duct tape after being like, maybe if they find the remains, they'll think that it's something that it wasn't. But it doesn't make sense to me. Like, you'd think George and Casey, if she drowned, they would just call 911. Like, you have nothing to hide. That's what I'm saying. Like, if it was an accident, you'd call 911 and have somebody come over and, like, try to resuscitate her or, like, come and, like, get out the situation like you made it that 20,000 times worse and brought all these people involved if it was just an accident I just admit that it was an accident but I don't think it was an accident yeah I mean sadly it happens all the time where a child dr- drowns accidentally when someone like is not watching them for a couple minutes right they could sneak out there or even if everyone's out there they could just fall into the pool right so it happens all the time and this was brought up as well in that documentary that just like the way Casey's brain works, like they think because she compartmentalizes things and she had trauma. So if Kaylee did die accidentally, like her first thought would be like, oh, people are going to think I'm a bad mom because I wasn't watching her. I was neglectful. So I kind of I have to cover that up. That's what I have to cover up that I wasn't watching her. And then this is how she dealt with that. So I don't know what to think of that. You have to go back to the fact that like, was she abused as a child by her father? We don't know that either. Yeah, that's what they're saying. Like, if she was abused, then the way her brain was kind of formed because of that would make her not think rationally in this situation. Ugh, I don't know. It's so hard because, we'll, you know, you can't believe anything Casey says. So if she ever does say anything about it, you don't even know if it's true. So, I mean, ugh, I don't know. I don't know what to believe. When I first went into this, I had in my mind that, yeah, she's 100% premeditated murder. But then once I, I get into the details of all this evidence... Now I'm not completely convinced. And that's the thing that the ju- that I'm going to talk about, what the jury was talking about. They could not link Casey to Kaylee's death without a question. There's nothing that just smoking gun, really. The duct tape, there's nothing linking Casey to that. Like her death, there's nothing actually linking Casey to that, right? So, I mean, this theory never comes up. But I mean, if Casey was asleep, Kaylee could have wandered off. Somebody could have kidnapped her, killed her and dumped her in the woods. That's not unbelievable, right? I'm so fascinated why that never scenario never even came up. Yeah, and that would explain the duct tape, right? If you're yeah. being kidnapped, someone duct tape is a common thing I think people would use and not something that your own mother would have to put on your face, right? So I mean that it's funny that that never comes up. That's kind of where my mind goes to, and she wanted to cover up the fact that she fell asleep and left her child to wander out the house without her. But why not? Yeah, but then why not call nine one one once you realize she's missing? So that doesn't make sense. Yeah, why wait thirty one days? Yeah, and then also while your child's missing, why go out partying at the club? So the way her mind works, like it just doesn't make sense. Not, none of these scenarios make sense, really, right? So she's probably just thinking like wanting this problem to just go away. Like whatever happened, she wants it to just go away, hoping. It, I mean, but she has to know it's going to come out, and then like when it does come out. She has to know that, like, it's going to come up that she went out partying and she was getting tattoos and all this stuff. Like, she has to know that, like, that's not a good look. So you'd think that that would be enough to be like, I have to not do that. Like, she has to know there's going to be some type of investigation. And in that investigation, it's going to come up that she was doing all this other stuff. So I just don't see what her plan was. And it's just sad because she brought all these people into her boyfriends and, like, roommates and friends and family and everybody else. And this poor old nanny person like just ruined a lot of people's lives over lies and it's brought up multiple times that when people look back and they think about her and they see pictures she was actually like a good mom 
she would hang out with her. She would play with Kaylee. She had a cute room with lots of toys and stuff. So it wasn't like she was neglected and not loved. Of course, she lived with her grandparents. So her grandparents probably had a lot to do with that. But whenever people would say they'd see Casey and Kaylee together, you know, it's like they had a good relationship and Kaylee loved her mom because she was a good mom. But everything that I've ever seen of Casey, she never says anything like, oh, I miss my daughter. I'm scared for her. I want her back. That's never there. It's just, I didn't do it kind of thing, right? Like, I don't know what happened. So I didn't watch that documentary that recently came out with her. So I don't know, like, how she acted in that. But to me, every time I see her, she doesn't seem that concerned. No, she, when I watched it, it wasn't, I mean, she said I missed her. But her face was just so cold looking. Like, it's not like she even, like, meant it. Well, she cries a lot in the documentary, but, yeah, but I don't that... know what, I don't know. She, she's a perpetual victim. She's constantly the victim. She's constantly. Yeah. People have done her wrong, you know, whether it's her brother, whether it's her mother or father or the police or whoever. Like, she's always, there's always someone that's the victim. And it's hard to watch that documentary because. I don't really believe anything that she's saying. Even her own story that she's talking about in this documentary is like not even congruent with the timeline I just read of the events of that day, like who she's texting and all that stuff. She was on the computer for a full hour or two hours when she said she was sleeping. So I don't know. It's just when you have someone who's that much of a liar, you can't. It just muddies the water so much. What I can't get over, I mean, this has probably nothing to do with, well, it kind of has something to do with the case is that her defense lawyer, I think it was, brought her into his home and she like lives there. In this documentary, like, she lives there with him and his family. Like, that's where she lives. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I was going to bring that up later. Oh, sorry. No, it's fine. But, yeah. But I'm just, like, it's so strange to me. Yeah. Yeah, that's unheard of. I've never heard of that happening before. I find that really odd. I don't know. I was, like, why is she living with him? That's the most weirdest thing ever. I know. She works for him, or she did, as his assistant, like, a legal assistant kind of thing. Because no one else will hire her, I'm sure. Well, yeah, she started her own like photography business, but then she just got too much bad comments and bad reviews, and people knew who she was, so she had to shut that down fast. Yeah. She's like the most hated woman in America at one point. She still is, probably. Or one of them, at least. Yeah, definitely one of them. What I was going to say about like the jury, like when you think, okay, like she's 100% guilty in my eyes, in my opinion, so it's like hard when the jury acquits her. But I can really think, I was thinking about it and I was kind of comparing it to the last case we did, like the OJ case. In that case, I think OJ, they were biased towards OJ, like they, or they were on his side, kind of biased against the prosecution right from the get-go. But in this one, you can't really make that case because that they were biased, because if you're going to, if they were biased against anyone, it would have been Casey herself. So I think that they were the most fair that they could be. And maybe you don't agree with their decision, but. I believe I watched it. I watched an interview with a juror too, and they were saying that I think it was Jennifer. The, her was the name of the juror, and she was saying that like they were trying to map it out in their mind how she died, how she got to the woods, how sh she got in the trunk if she was in the trunk. Like there were so many questions, you can't really draw a line between this and you know A and B clearly. And if you don't have that information, you can't really, in good conscience, say that someone's guilty and give them the death penalty when you have that many questions. So while I do think that she's, like, guilty, but, like, I can see their their rationale. Yeah, I can totally agree with that because whether you you don't like the outcome, but they were following the law, really. Like, they didn't put emotions into it. And as, if they do have a reasonable doubt, which they for sure did, then they had to say not guilty, which is what they did. So I think they, like, did their job as best as they could, even though everybody hates them. <laughs> Yeah. And like, if you believe in the system the way that it is, and if you believe in a jury and like the concept of a jury, then you have to respect at least that. Well, yeah, I find it amazing that they were able to set emotions aside and, like, you know, you just, you just look at that cute little face of Kaylee and be and still be able to acquit her. I think that's amazing that they were even able to to do that. Yeah, that is like the essence of a jury, the whole purpose of a jury trial. That is what it is. It's like you separate the emotions and you just look at the facts as they are. And they did. And they didn't have the facts that they needed. And like Katie said, that one, that, you know, foolproof suffocation search that didn't come up until after the trial and all the stuff that came out after, like that could have hugely changed it because clearly they were going on facts. And even the jury says in her interview after that, she's willing to, you know, 
they want to make the right decision. So it's not like they're not willing to give that guilty verdict. It's like they're more than willing to do that if they have the evidence and the facts to back it up. But they're based on facts and they just didn't have it or enough of them to make that decision. It's got to be one of the hardest jobs in the world to do. I know. I always say like, oh, I can't wait until I get called for jury duty. But I would never want to be on a jury for a case like this. No, me neither. It would just be so hard to make a decision. And I feel like you'd think about, no matter which way you went, you'd be thinking about it forever. Mm -hmm. You hear these interviews from these jurors and they say they think about it every day. Like it's a part of their life now. That's just who they are now is like this juror and they always think about their decision. Yeah. And they get lots of hate and, and all this stuff too. And like they get a lot of stuff thrown at them. But but they're just there to do their job. That That's their job. And Yeah. They're there to do a job and they did it to the best of their ability. Yeah, like we mentioned before, like just the public was so emotional about it. So many people already had their minds made up. So the jury did the best that they could. And like I said, their decision, I think, was amazing that they were able to separate emotion out of this. Yeah, basically what I'm saying is that I can respect their decision, even though I don't agree. Yeah, exactly. I feel the same. Same. The backlash to the verdict was huge. The world was watching this case unfold and the public had already convicted Casey and they saw her as a child killer right from the get-go. And when she was acquitted, there was just a huge amount of hate for the jury. And so in an ABC News article, Dr. Carol Lieberman, who's a forensic psychiatrist in the Department of Psychiatry at UCLA, said, quote, The main reason that people are reacting so strongly is that the media convicted Casey before the jury decided on the verdict. The public has been whipped up in this frenzy wanting revenge for this poor little adorable child and because of the desire for revenge they've been whipped up into a lynch mob end quote and yeah so she's right because you could see like just the footage of the protesters and people calling her a baby killer calling her an angel killer and some people refer to this as oj number two so it's funny that you mentioned oj because people were like comparing this to oj and so after the acquittal, Casey was getting death threats, as you can imagine, and she went into hiding, but the jury members were also getting death threats. And typically, in Florida anyway, the names of the juries are released to the public immediately after a trial, but in this case, the judge actually ordered that there be a delay in releasing the names, just to kind of allow for a cooling off period to protect the jury. And... You know, once they found out who the jury was, people were coming to their homes, they were knocking on their doors, and reporters were trying to interview them. And so it must have been a really scary time for the jurors. I can't believe that's even allowed. Yeah, I know. Is that just like a Florida thing, or is that like every time there's like a juror trial with juries? Honestly, I think the jury names are always released, maybe. I don't think that should be allowed, because that's just dangerous for the jury. In Florida, it is anyway. Oh, in Florida, okay, but awful in florida they're always released because of that sunshine act okay everything is public knowledge but yeah i'm not sure every state everywhere the jury names are released i would think that they should be protected but i don't know anything about that really so yeah must have been super scary for the jury and in the documentary that i've been talking about this whole time the case of kaylee anthony laura she talks to one of the jurors and it's the same one that you were mentioning aj the jennifer ford she finally comes forward to talk about her experience and she does recall getting threats and people saying really nasty things to her and the jury. She says she got hundreds of very hostile and violent messages and some of them that she read were, quote, you have to be the biggest idiot in the world. And another one was, good luck when you go meet your maker. Maybe you and Casey can hang out in hell together. So people are just super pissed at this jury. They just could not believe what they had done in this case. And Jennifer talks about why the jury made some of the decisions that they did. And she says that having the death penalty as an option really took a toll on the jury. Because like, as you were saying, AJ, you don't believe in the death penalty. And so they're saying if they convict her of murder, they might be putting a person to death, which I think weighed so heavily on them. And her thought was that if Casey didn't murder her daughter and then they decide to sentence her to death, then they're saying that, well, they're just a murderer too. But I also feel they can still convict you and then decide on a sentence later, right? Like, just because the prosecution's going for the death penalty, like, can't they say she's guilty? And then they go on to the sentencing phase, which is where they decide. Yeah, but I think the judge decides the sentencing, so 
they could like recommend not the death penalty, but it's ultimately up to the judge. So I think if they did say yes, first degree premeditated murder, and then the judge decides death penalty, well, it's like, well, it was, they had a hand in that decision, oh. I think is what they're thinking, right? So, which I mean, yeah, that'd be super hard to be like, yeah, it was our decision that made her get the death penalty. So, and so some people are thinking like if maybe if the prosecution didn't go so heavily with the death penalty side of it that maybe they would have had a different outcome yeah that's what annoys me too it's like just because the death penalty is illegal in that state doesn't mean you have to go for it so that's annoying exactly and and jennifer even says like because the state was going for a death penalty like they were expecting them to have so much more evidence that pointed to casey without a doubt and so she was saying like the bar was set a little bit higher their expectations were a little bit higher and then the prosecution just like couldn't deliver and so that was one of the reasons why they didn't say first degree murder as well. And yeah, and she says that people, she felt like people were expecting them to have a much more emotional response that we were talking about to the trial rather than being objective and following the law. Further, she says that the whole jury kind of felt or most of the most of the jury felt that what the defense had to say was really irrelevant. Like they didn't really care what the defense was. They were only interested in what the prosecution was presenting because they needed that proof to point to Casey. They needed to have that convincing evidence that linked Casey to the murder of Kaylee without a doubt. And they felt that they just didn't get that, which it makes sense because, I mean, I feel like I still don't know for sure, right? Like, I don't, I'm not convinced that she 100% it was premeditated, right? And so Jennifer personally believes that Casey had some involvement in Kaylee's death, but she can't say exactly what it is. And, of course, we'll probably never know the truth. And... In this documentary, they also talk to the presiding judge in this case, Belvin Perry. And Perry says that Jose Baez, who was on the defense, he ingeniously planted these little seeds of doubt everywhere throughout the trial. And Jose did say during the trial that the prosecution was just throwing everything against the wall to see what stuck. And one thing that matches his theory was that the chloroform debacle... He says the prosecution hammered on the fact that chloroform was searched for 84 times. One of the prosecutors said, search for chloroform 84 times. Like she said that over and over again. And then a couple of days later, they had to come out and admit that, oh, actually, that report was wrong. So, you know, forget about the chloroform 84 times. And so it was just kind of like the prosecution really wasn't confident. They were not presenting things that were 100%. And so that, you know, wasn't a good look for them. Even though, of course, they didn't mean to, but... It's just those little things here and there, this doubt that was being planted over and over again. And Perry also brought up the fact that the prosecution did not present any arguments for the other charges that were laid, right? So there was the aggravated child abuse and there was the aggravated manslaughter of a child. Those were charges that were brought there as well. And so the prosecution was very hell-bent on getting a conviction for first-degree murder and so they never said that if you disagree with that charge, you have other options. And so, of course, the jury knew they had other options, but it wasn't presented as, okay, maybe it wasn't first-degree murder, but it could have been one of these. The judge, Perry, said, basically, the prosecution said, give us all or nothing. It's either death penalty or nothing. And that's, like, basically what the jury gave them was nothing because they just couldn't go for the death penalty. And so... In an article by People Magazine, written in 2021, they talked to another male juror who was, at the time, still anonymous, and he could still be anonymous to this day. I mean, he's not anonymous, but the person who spoke out didn't say who he was. He spoke out like a month after the trial. He said, quote, Generally, none of us liked Casey Anthony at all. She seemed like a horrible person. But the prosecution did not give us enough evidence to convict. They gave us a lot of stuff that makes us think she probably did something wrong, but not beyond a reasonable doubt, end quote. So, like, again, it's just that the prosecution just could not, was not convincing enough. And, I mean, it makes sense. They just didn't have the evidence. He also recalls that several jurors were battling their conscience as they voted to acquit, but they felt that they had no choice but to follow the law. Of course, that's what they had to do, but... They didn't feel good about their decision. And the juror says his decision haunts him still. And if he could do it over again, he would push harder for one of those lesser charges 
rather than acquittal of most of them. So he said he just really didn't stand up for himself. He didn't stand up for what he thought probably should be what she should have been charged with. And so they all just kind of agreed to acquit her on most things, which, of course, probably feel super bad about that now. Can't go back and change it. So that, you know, got to be tough. As Steph said before, in May of 2017, Casey actually moved into the home of one of the defense counsels in this case, Patrick McKenna. And she worked as one of his legal assistants and lived in his house. And I don't think she lives there anymore. There's reports that she kind of moved out and got her own place. But he helped her launch her own private investigation firm. And so I think that's what she's doing today, maybe. She kind of lives a low-profile, quiet life. She's estranged from her father, but talks to her mother and brother every now and then, even though they're not super close. And like I said, she claims that she doesn't know what happened to Kaylee. This was back when this... This was like in 2021, they said she didn't know what happened to Kaylee. But you said that she does agree with that she drowned in the pool now. So I guess she blocked it out of her memory, and then now she remembers? I, I don't know. I'm not sure. Who knows? I know, right? And so I guess... Maybe the one good thing that came out of this whole thing is now that there is something called Kaylee's Law. And this law requires felony charges for a parent or legal guardian who fails to report a missing child in cases where the parent knew or should have known the child was in possible danger. So you always see like these tragedies happen. At least there's something like this, like a new law that gets brought forward because there's obviously a gap in the law or you know, something that falls through the cracks. So Kaylee's Law is now a thing. But yeah, that's kind of where this whole thing wraps up. This big, crazy Casey Anthony case. Yeah, I guess that's the one silver lining of it all is that law, which should have been a law before, but... I know. It's not even a law in all states. It's like 11 states have signed on, so it's not even a majority in everywhere, but it's progress. Yeah, it just sucks that it takes things like this to have those laws happen. <laughs> I know. Like, I never even thought of that when she didn't report her child missing. It's like, well, you'd think that that would be a thing that you're supposed to do. No, just very recently now that became a thing that you're supposed to do. So kind of crazy. It's common sense is a thing to do. Yeah. To report someone when they go missing. Well, yeah, you'd think. Yeah. I was going to ask you guys, do you think the juror's decision is more like the defense did such a good job with putting that doubt in, or do you think the prosecution didn't do a good enough job? Like, was it the failure of the prosecution or, like, a success of the defense? It's always what I can't decide, but I guess that one juror said that, like, they didn't care what the defense had to say. They were just disappointed or let down by the prosecution. Yeah, I think it's a combination of both, but I think the majority of it had to do with just the fact that the prosecution could not link Casey directly to her murder. Like, there was no actual smoking gun. If Casey's fingerprints were on that duct tape, then yeah, that would have been a smoking gun for sure. But there's just nothing that could link her unquestionably to the murder. So I don't think the prosecution did a good enough job, and which is why the jury had a easier time with the verdict. I shouldn't say easier time because it's never easy, but... Yeah, like I think there's obviously some places where I think the prosecution dropped the ball, but for me, I think it's like, they also can't create evidence that they don't have, right? Like, there was just a lack of evidence in this case in general, and they had to do their best with that. Yeah, exactly. Like we mentioned before, I think the fact that they were trying to pursue the death penalty so hard is that they should have had more solid evidence to back that up, which is what the jury was expecting, and it wasn't there, so that's kind of where they fell short. And also, I think like, the defense, I think, did like a, a really good job Obviously, they did a good enough job to get her off, but also just kind of hammering in that fact that the prosecution really has nothing solid was really all they needed to do. But then they went beyond that. So, yeah, it's it's definitely a crazy case. Yeah, I guess maybe the takeaway is never don't go for the death penalty if you can't back it up. I mean, also, I mean, just don't go for the death penalty in general. You should never, but especially if you can't back it up well enough, I guess. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And also, I guess just one last thing I was going to ask. I know there was a lot of talk to like after the trial and during it that like they thought that maybe Cindy would be hit with perjury charges because they did think that she lied on the stand in order to defend Casey by like backtracking on the smell in the car because she said in the call that she thought there'd been a dead body there. And then she kind of backtracks on that during the trial. 
She also kind of takes blame for the chloroform search or the chlorophyll search. So there was talk of like, will she be hit with perjury charges? People think she lied on the stand. So what do you guys kind of find out overall thoughts of George and Cindy in this case? I don't think Cindy had any, I don't think she had any involvement. I think she was trying to maybe protect her daughter like a mother would. I feel bad for her because she was just trying to protect her daughter or trying to figure out what was going on. But also, Cindy did perjure herself. Like, it came out like she first she said she didn't search for chloroform, but then at the trial, she admitted that she actually did. They're not going to charge her with perjury, but I think she actually did perjure herself. Yeah, I guess that's true. I mean, no one's going to go forward and actually pursue that because a waste of everyone's time. Yeah, it's so minor. Did she actually look up chloroform? I mean, she's a nurse, so maybe she... I think she admitted that she actually did search for chloroform. Whether it was related to anything, like, that could just be some random thing, but... I mean, I search for random shit all the time, so if you were going to connect, like, a bunch of stuff, they'd be like, that's sketchy. Yeah, true. And also, like, I... I, I looked up chloroform. Yeah, you, you just searched for chloroform. <laughs> yeah, just yeah. to see I what I searched for chloroform, too. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so, like... If we do this true crime podcast, like we probably have a lot of searches, like when we're doing research that if people looked into would like maybe be sketchy. Yeah. If someone took it out of context, they'd be like, oh, yeah. there's something wrong yeah, here. Yeah. So it's <laughs> just, yeah, I don't know. I, but also just because she's a nurse too, doesn't mean she would, why would she be looking at chloroform just because she's a nurse? I don't think nurses use that either. I don't, it's like a chemical. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what the purpose would be, but. It's a cleaning chemical. Well, I think it's, Is it not? you can find trace amounts like in some cleaners. I'm pretty sure, like, the use of it to sedate is not legal. Oh, okay. No, no, they used to use it as, like, a sedative in, like, actual, like, in hospitals, like, way back in the day. They don't do that anymore. But, yeah, I don't know what they use it for now, but... Anyway. I feel like there's, yeah, there's, like, almost more questions than we have answers still. The trial almost, like, didn't answer anything that you w- wanted it to. No, I created more questions, I feel. I know. There's like so much back and forth. Yeah, that like you still don't even know what the hell happened. I mean, you never will. Like, it's one of those things you're never going to know. And it's sad. It's like the great one of the great mysteries we'll never know. And it's never going to be solved, right? They're never like, are they ever going like, to look into it again? Like figure out like if there's anybody else involved? Like I don't think that's ever going to happen. Well, I mean, Casey's own defense is that she died accidentally. So I guess there is nothing to look into from her perspective. Yeah, I guess people can't even agree if it was a murder, so they're probably not going to keep investigating because it was an accident, I guess they're saying. So, yeah, it's sad. Yeah, and I mean, and I guess in a way, Casey got really lucky with the lack of, she did do it, which I believe she did, but she got lucky that the remains were found so late and they had to decompose so much and like that they didn't have anything. Because if she really did do it, it could have ended up really way worse for her if they had something more solid. Then she's, one of the only people I know that got away with murder. Well, OJ. Yeah, OJ did too. Oh, true, yes. All those lies that she had after the fact, saying where she worked and she was like misleading everybody for so long, it kind of like stalled them to actually finding her, right? So it's kind of like she knew that was going to happen and the longer that it took for them to find her, the better it was for her. So it's kind of, she did kind of think it through, right? Yeah. So maybe she's smarter than we all gave her credit for. But. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, really though. I don't know. Just crazy. It was a crazy case. And yeah, I kind of go back and like revisiting it again. Like this is the first time, obviously, I've gone this far in depth into this case since back when it was all over the news. So, yeah, so many questions and no answers. So it's annoying. Mm -hmm, Yeah. But we just have to remember that like Kaylee is the real only real victim in this. Casey is no victim. And, you know, George and Cindy, I mean, they're They say lost their granddaughter. But yeah, the only real victim in this is Kaylee and all of that stuff. And kind of like the after effects and like kind of the the ripple effect that it had. Like it basically ruined this family, you know, whether it was an accident or it was a murder. The whole family got ruined and just everyone else too, like Zanny, even Zanny the nanny, like her life was ruined or in some way. Yeah, I can't imagine anyone's going to hire her as a nanny now, even though she had nothing to do with it. Yeah, like she probably has to change her name. So it just ruins everyone's life who was like even remotely close to Casey or knew her so well Zanny didn't even know Casey so even people she didn't know I guess yeah so just a sad and wild case overall so yeah I guess that brings us to the end of our analysis of this case Uh, we hope that you've enjoyed listening to our thoughts and kind of revisiting this case with us and we want to hear your thoughts on the verdict and what the jury's ultimate decision was and Do you believe that they made the right decision? Do you believe that they followed the law? 
and did their job as they were supposed to? And what do you think of the defense and the prosecution and all of that kind of stuff? We want to hear from you. So follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Crime Family Podcast. We're on X, formerly Twitter, at Crime Family Pod 1. I feel like half the time when I'm doing this outro, I say Twitter and the other half I say X, but you know what I mean. Yeah, X on Crime Family Pod 1. You can also join our Patreon page if you want to support the show and get some bonus content. And you can get some merch from the show. We would love to have you uh, buy some merch. So the links to those things are in the show notes, as always. And yeah, engage with us as much as you can. Send us emails at crimefamilypodcast at gmail.com. We have a contact form on our website. So you can fill that out. Give us your questions, your comments. Get, leave us a review. Give us a rating on all the stuff. You, you guys know the drill by now. So yeah, do all the stuff. And uh, all of our episodes are now on YouTube. Yeah, so f- go subscribe to us on YouTube. Um, even if you don't listen to your podcast on YouTube, go subscribe and maybe comment on some of the videos. Uh, we'd love to see your thoughts because, again, we don't we can't really improve or know what we're doing that we need to improve on unless you tell us. <laughs> so we'll, even if it's like constructive feedback, we'd love to hear it. But also, if you love the show, we'd love to hear that, too. So thanks so much. We hope you enjoyed our analysis of the Kaylee Anthony murder case and the Casey Anthony trial. And we'll be back next week for part one of a brand new case that we're going to do a deep dive on. Yeah, you'll find out what that's going to be next week when we release it. So thanks so much. And until next time, take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.